as soon as this goes to live. And we are live, apparently. Uh, oh, wait. Ah, crap. I don't have a, uh, a, a patron message. Are you, are you just going to paste that in at the, at the beginning? Oh, um, I don't have a patron message for you immediately. So, If there's like a Dropbox home for one, I can play it just right off the computer. Great. I'll send you a link. Um, Dropbox. Mm-hmm. Should uh, I hide myself at this black. point? Oh, Patreon intros. Here we go. Um, oh, no. It's using my face. Oh, whatever. <laughs> His face we're expecting. No, normally I when I log in, it's through the DTNS. Oh, account, gotcha. But I have like okay. three Google accounts open because I freelance, and so I have things going to different inboxes. Ah, well, they'll have to have my weird shit in here. It's doing a face. weird thing where it's not letting me give a Dropbox link, which is super annoying. Hold on. You guys do this show daily? <laughs> and mostly on time. Uh, hold on. Are we live? Uh, tweet uh, we are live on the stream. I'm wondering why I can't. Oh, because I turned Dropbox off. That's awesome. Um, hold on. Sorry. <coughs> All right. Dropbox. You know what, Justin? It's not... My Dropbox won't let me send you a Dropbox link, which I find amazing. Uh, Okay, so would it just be easier for you to paste it in afterward? Yep. Wait, oh, maybe I'll do it now. Hold on one more second. I love when things don't work. Um, yeah, I'll paste it in after. Let me take a second and re- actually re-record. All right, you can start anytime you want. All right. Yeah, shit. Okay. All right, everybody's muted. Ready to go? Ready to go. Well, I was born semi-ready. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 14th, 2015. I'm Justin Robert Young, filling in for Tom Merritt, who is watching his nephew graduate this weekend. Joining me is uh, a, a lifelong friend and somebody that uh, I think can bring a fresh perspective now that uh, we've uh, vacated Tom for the uh, for, for the afternoon. He is the star of Don't Trust Andrew Maine on A&E, as well as the author of many books and like as like I mentioned, a dear friend, Andrew Main. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a a I think a, a really really great discussion. Considering how much time uh, we have both shopped at Walmart's, uh, it is it is fitting <laughs> that we uh, we have a big Walmart story here. But first, let's get into the headlines. Apple's Beats-based streaming music service will be renamed Apple Music and integrate deep social networking for artists, according to 9to5Mac. The service will allow artists to have pages so they can post samples, photos, video, concert information, and content from other artists. iTunes, user will have, uh, iTunes users will have the ability to comment on and like posts from artists but won't have social network profiles like Ping. Apple Music will be introduced at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference kickoff keynote on Monday, June 8th. Andrew, it's easy to get excited for big new Apple uh, projects. However, social network and Apple have tended to result in disaster. And am I crazy to say that this kind of sounds like MySpace? Uh I don't think you're crazy at all. I, of course, what the actual version of what it's going to be, you know, we'll have to see. But 
I don't. It's not a space that just sounds very exciting for Apple to get into. I mean, clearly with music and iTunes, they were the forerunner, and and now as streaming has evolved and changed, and they want to get into that space, they need to differentiate themselves. But I don't. I don't know. I just don't. I. I don't get it. I guess. I mean, I get where in a boardroom this sounds like a neat idea, like oh, we can interact with bands and stuff like that that people are already doing on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And to try to create this sort of fourth place that that would take place, I, I don't. I, and that's not even you know. You look at where social networking these things are going is that you know people are kind of moving away from platforms in general. Yeah. So the the only thing that I could see that makes this a little bit more appealing is if you have exclusive albums and, and tracks that Apple makes these deals with artists that right now we've already seen that Beyonce drops her album on iTunes and, and all of a sudden it's the biggest thing overnight. Uh, you've seen maybe Apple's learned the lesson where, hey, if we force a new U2 record on everybody's phone, it's <laughs> a, a bit of a PR disaster. But if U2 has an exclusive on our streaming service, maybe it's a reason for people to subscribe. Yeah, I think there, there certainly can be something in pushing I mean I, I I think creating new ways to create product or define what product is you know you I just watched on a uh, Netflix they have Superman did the documentary of Shep Gordon is a guy who worked with Alice Cooper and a number of other bands and they talk about back in the day Alice Cooper records and how they would take like they had one record that looked like you know when you know a desk and you open up the desk and like inside was like you know women's panties and these other things inside of there it was a record album and it, but it was this really cool kind of thing that you'd sit there listen to what the music and all that and I certainly think there's opportunities to say okay how do we help artists create different kinds of experiences on the web so it's not just about selling a 99 cent or dollar 29 cent single well, speaking of low-cost music, RDO has launched a new premium tier allowing listeners to stream music on demand. RDO Select costs $3.99 per month and offers unlimited streaming radio without ads. You can stream up to 25 on-demand tracks per day or store them for offline playback. Plus, you can swap out tracks for alternatives, but you're still limited to 25 streams or downloads per day. The new tier is available for users in the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and South Africa. Other countries will be added in the future. Do you subscribe to any of these streaming services, Andrew? Um, I've done Pandora, and then you know I don't know if iTunes Match quite subscribe counts as that. And then with the Amazon Unlimited Music, you get some of that. But whenever I hear them announce like a pricing tier when it comes to streaming music, I think about whenever I get you know. Comcast or Time Warmer sends me the thing that says, oh, get all this cable for like $30 a month, you know, for six months. And you're yeah. like, what will the price, here, what will be, we know this is a price to get people on board, and if you look at the economics of streaming, you know, there are a lot of people saying this can't last, this will not work, and so we know there's, you know, pricing is going to have to go up or pricing is going to have to fall down as far as, you know, what the artists get, et cetera. So I don't get, you know, to me it's, it's it's not economics, it's marketing. Yeah. Well, switching from streaming, Walmart challenges Amazon with unlimited shipping for $50 a year. The service promises 70,000 items at launch and three-day shipping. According to a Walmart company spokesman, the program will be invite-only initially and will evolve with feedback from early customers. Will this be a legitimate competitor to Amazon Prime? We'll pick that apart in the discussion section a little bit later on. Uh, initial thoughts, Andrew? Uh, I think a lot. <laughs> I got. I just the, one of the things we have to think about is how they're going to compete. I just got a box from Amazon, you know, which you get excited. Like, look at this box, like, right? You know, yeah. I have a friend. She remarked that you know the UPS truck is like the adult version of the ice cream truck. <laughs> and I open up. That would be uh, Ed and Stranger who said that. I open this up and I'm thinking like, man, what did I order that was this big? What did I order? And, and for those of you who are only listening to this via podcast, Andrew is opening up a, a fairly medium-sized Amazon box with a lot of packaging, and he is now revealing... Uh, it, 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 it one, is One thin strip of watch batteries. <laughs> that is the size smaller than a bookmark. This was on my step right before I walked in the door to do the show. And I'm like, perfect visual aid for a podcast. Um, Amazon... 
when you break down what they spend on shipping and all that, they're constantly trying to figure out how to do that, how much they actually lose in that area versus how much they make, and that's a larger discussion to see does Walmart have the stones to try to go head-to-head -head with them on that. And we will dig into it. VentureBeat is reporting that Google has announced six new apps for its $35 streaming media stick. CBS All Access, HDTV, Fox Now, FX Now, Pluto TV, and Haystack. Pluto TV curates over 100 channels of news, music, sports, web, and television shows. While Haystack presents trending TV news, you can get the apps from Chromecast.com slash apps. Windows 10 Mobile's latest build, 10080. I don't know what the proper nomenclature for that is. Add some important updates according to TechCrunch. The biggest is the first look at the Windows Store for mobile, which will allow uh, Microsoft to deliver universal Office apps, plus music, movies, and TV shows. Other features include an Xbox app, uh, Xbox app, a music app, and a new camera app, as well as a video app. It's a lot of apps. That's a lot of apps, man. Baby's got apps. Konami's big focus moving forward will be mobile and not AAA games, according to a translated interview with the company's new CEO. Uh, you know what? Just go ahead and look it up yourself. Hideke <laughs> Hayakawa? There we go. Uh, Andrew, you know, Konami's gotten a lot of flack lately. This seems to be something that people are more excited about. Uh, what well, what's your thought on that? I think that you know you're looking at your your when you go through these big huge changes in uh, video games in and platforms and stuff like that, and and the revolutionary changes in platforms happens maybe every twenty years or so. You had the cabinet to the desk console desktop, you know, excuse me, to like you know the uh, the console you hooked up to your TV. You had PC stuff, and then you had the merging of PC and those consoles into what we have in the modern form of PlayStations and Xboxes. And now, as mobile becomes the 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 big platform, and not just little hand and not handheld, but mobile, uh, it's disruptive. It's very disruptive. You know, Nintendo finally said, "Hey, you know, we're going to actually try to push towards other platforms besides our own." You know, and here's you know one of the biggest. You know, uh, licensing one of the biggest creators of properties there is with Konami, and I think that for them to say we're going to do a focus on mobile, because you look at where is the growth, where is the money? Yeah, it's it's, it's not in consoles, you know, and it's as exciting as Oculus might be, and some of these other things. It's the hand you walk into a restaurant and you look around the table with anybody who's younger than eighteen, and they've got you know an iPad out, they're playing something. It's just it's huge. So, I think that makes it you know I think it makes sense. So speaking of Nintendo and their push toward mobile, if you are excited for Mario-themed Candy Crush knockoffs or Zelda-enhanced Clash of Clans, you'll be able to hold on to your rupees, because according to Nintendo's CEO Satoru I Iwata, the venerable video game titan won't obsess over trends and avoid quote-unquote imitating popular games as they venture into the mobile space. He adds, quote, I don't think we can realize what we aspire to by simply imitating a past success formula. Now, this has certainly been the path to profitability uh, when it comes to just reskinning popular games with slightly different variables, but Nintendo seems to be relying more on in, you know, original pathways for their IP. I think that's a very smart strategy, you know, if they can hold up on it. But, I mean, you look at... You look at the problems that you know Zynga got into and Rovio and some of these studios. The only way they can hold on now, and that's in Rovio for specifically, but is by trying to emulate what other people have done. They come out with one hit that they get, you know, cat, you know, they get humongous success off of, right? You know, and then all of a sudden they can do IPOs or they can increase the valuation of the companies on that. But finding those other hits are really hard, and they either try to acquire or imitate. I think for Nintendo to say, hey we're going to keep being Nintendo and coming out with fun, original things. We're not just going to slap our characters on another title. It's great because it's all too easy to, you know, get lost in the shovel. And you even have, you know, really good games that come out that the imitators then start performing better than. Yeah. And so to get into that, you know, area, and, you know, dozens of imitators will come out there and one of them might strike it better, you know, which we saw with, like, you know, threes getting knocked off. Well, you know, it certainly is iterative, especially on very simple... Uh, concept games to to kind of add the wrinkle that makes it all the different, especially if you have already 
conquered it and you want to continue to have that experience. And there's something neat too about the idea of just saying, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna throw, you know, Mario I mean, ironically into back into, you know, Flappy Bird, you know, that we're not just gonna skin the games that are Nintendo. Let's make special Nintendo games. Let's create excitement. And I think that's one of the things that we don't have as much in mobile that we have in consoles, because of consoles, the life cycle is so much longer. Releases are big. Releases are really, really, really huge. It's not so much for mobile unless it's tied into a console release, but if you get into like, hey, you know, we're coming out with you know, a new Mario totally for the iPhone, that would be, I think that would be a big deal. Although, you know, it is sacrificing something because Nintendo has very powerful intellectual property. If it is good enough to have Universal Studios make a theme park out of it, then it is good enough to play as a Clash of Clash of Clans skin. But I think it is, it's a good move. Well, we saw, you know, Star Wars and Disney have gone through that where they found out that sometimes putting their name on a lot of things didn't help, and they went back, pulled back from licensing agreements. Yeah. The New York Times reports that Reddit announced an update to its site-wide policies today that explicitly prohibits harassment against users. As of today, users who view or experience harassment will be able to email Reddit moderators who can remove content and ban offenders from the site. Reddit defines harassment as, quote, continued actions unquote, that would make somebody, quote, conclude that Reddit is not a safe platform to express their ideas, end quote. The company said the number one reason Reddit users do not recommend the site to others is to avoid exposing friends to hate and offensive content. This seems to be a growing trend with platforms. Specifically, Twitter made a big point about this over the last month or so to say, you want to know what? Growth is great. We love growth. However, now we need to take care of the housework a little bit when it comes to harassment. Is this Reddit growing up, or is Reddit always just going to be kind of assessed? Well, I mean, it 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 has a choice. It you know it can look at itself and say, okay, do we want to? It, it is an amazing resource, an amazing resource. You know, the Ask Me Anything's on Reddit. I think are just one of the most fa- you know awesome social experiments there is, and, and great for discovering things. The communities there are great. You know, we're using it here, and they're looking at it, saying, "Okay, do we want to be a a big social platform like Facebook and other places, or do we want to be, you know, 4chan?" And yeah. I think that for Reddit, you know, they they wisely want to not become what 4chan is, and you know, you lose out on something when you have that sort of lawless sort of nature, and they want to move towards embrace it. The problem is just, you know. Policing this stuff is actually not that hard when you come when you realize that what you need you get a few people a few tiny 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 minority of people make it bad for everybody else, and the easiest way to deal with that is you make them you have to make them real people and make it hard to have anonymous accounts. And the way you do that is you have like credit card signups, um, yeah. but nobody wants to do that because once they do that, they lose a tremendous number of you know the overall size of people. Nobody wants to participate in more you know, and I think that. That's the challenge, is that if you want to make it super easy to create an account, you're going to make it super easy to create an abusive account. So, yeah, they'll be able to ban users. They'll keep popping up like whack-a-mole. Yeah. The question is, because I, I feel like Reddit is still smarting from some of the the fappening uh, stuff that went on a few mm-hmm. months ago. And and the, the curiosity for me is how or if this would have affected that as it mushroomed. Well, and, you know, the fappening gets into this sort of weird area where, you know, you, you compare that to the Sony leaks, you know, um, which, uh, granted, you know, having your nude photographs, you know, put out there is extremely embarrassing and invasive, et cetera, and all that, but for many people, so is having private emails, complaint grievances and things like that doing that, and, and the Sony reaction to the Sony leaks was, well, this is journalism. You know, this other thing isn't. Yet yeah. you get into this sort of weird, murky area, and I'm not for distributing these kinds of photographs against anybody's will. Maybe it's very, very clear. But you're you're gonna find that, like, you know, describing it as where somebody feels harassed or whoever they did that, that gets it's gonna get tricky. And even then, like, you know, great, we can ban that person, but you you pop up with the account, you know, of uh, you know, loser guy number three. Yeah, it's just going to be like Hydra, where two more pop up in its place. And and also, you the, the tendency for those people is they then make it their mission to go after it. You know, they get even more, you know, energized. 
So it turns out thieves can bypass Apple Watch passcodes and pair a stolen watch to their own phone. The Verge has compiled a bunch of reporting from 9to5Mac and iDownload blog that concluded the Apple Watch was incredibly easy to steal because it's very easy to, to reset an Apple Watch if you forget the password. Just hold the side button until the menu uh, appears with three options, power off, power reserve, and lock device. Then force touch that screen to unlock a hidden option to erase all content and settings. The watch has to be connected to its charger to activate the erase function which is exactly what a thief would do the moment he or she stole your Apple Watch. Time for an activation lock update, perhaps? Andrew, you are an Apple Watch user. Do you feel that your uh, new bobble is insecure? I I mean, it's insecure in that if somebody steals it, they wipe it. I'm not going to lose my information, just my watch. Uh, and, you know, putting those sort of restrictive measures on iPhones has cut down an iPhone theft, but it hasn't eliminated it because they're still useful for materials and parts and other things, etc. Um, I, yeah, I think, obviously, I think this should be addressed. I mean, every one of these has its own unique, you know, ID, ID device number that they can then, you know, make these things more secure, so uh, I'm not panicked. I think it'll probably be addressed. In the grand heat map of, of hacks that make uh, or, or uh, exploits that kind of make pop culture news or, or pop tech culture news and, and break out of sort of the hackosphere, I think this is more legitimate than, let's say, 3D printing somebody's thumb so you can use the Touch ID feature or something. Sure. I mean, but, well, but the difference here is that if... I, you know, if somebody 3D prints your thumb and uses your Touch they have access to your information. Here, they have your watch... They it's a re, it's functions like a brand new watch. We're talking about the loss of the use of the thing and not oh, the sure, loss of the use sure. of your account. Uh, I, just, I just mean in terms of a, a likelihood that. Uh, oh yeah, it's practical. I you know I'm um the idea that somebody could take something from me and get utility out of it is not a novel notion. <laughs> That's the way things always have been, and and obviously there's technology to make that. And probably in the case of the Apple Watch, you know, not happen. I think that'll you know I'm not I'm sure I'm pretty sure Apple's probably on it. <laughs> BizTech Africa reports that Safaricom, a Kenyan mobile network, oper mobile network operator, has announced the launch, launch of The Big Box, a set-top device that allows subscribers to watch TV and share broadband connectivity. The device will connect to Safaricom's 3G and 4G network and offer subscribers access to several high-def TV channels as well as on-demand video content. The device also serves as a Wi-Fi hotspot for up to 10 users. Subscribers have the option of several plans based on their needs. This is cool. I mean, you just you look at how the emergence of, of telecommunications in Africa, and you look at moving from when... I mean, you, you have places there that the economies are often based on buying, you know, minutes are now, you know, you know uh, bandwidth you know, like in chunks on their phones to now that you're getting a company that can go in there and put a streaming box that works over wireless networks and does that, and they think they can make it economically feasible, you know, for you to sit there and watch Daredevil in Botswana, you know, over a streaming thing. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. You know, I hope I hope something like this works. I hope something like that's successful. And if it's there, works there, like, great, let's bring that over here. <laughs> Africa has been... Uh, and has, I think, for the last decade and a half been a, an extraordinarily interesting place to watch, uh, especially in terms of uh, how much they rely on mobile. Uh, you know, just, just a fascinating incubator. Recode is reporting that Sharp secured a $1.9 billion bailout. Under the deal, main leaders Mizuro Bank and Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ will inject a combined 200 billion yen, that is $1.7 billion, in a debt for equity swap. In return for the funding, which will be used to repay debt and finance investments, Sharp will also sell its headquarters and said it might seek a partnership for its TV business in North America and 5,000 job cuts in its global workforce. Sharp posted an annual loss of 222 billion yen. This is Sharp's second bank-led rescue in three years. Yeesh. Sharp was one of those companies that it was one of these big international conglomerates in a 100-year-old company that was getting into so many different areas. And LCD panels, I think, became kind of a, a big part of their market. 
Uh, and you see the decline of these things. You see the, the growth, and then you see these things are not, they're not forever. And now, you know, you had, I remember when it was a big deal when they made the, la there was like the last TV that was ever made in the United States, and then all of a sudden, we never, nobody made TVs here anymore because it wasn't economical, and, and manufacturing had moved to Japan, and then manufacturing moved from there to China and Korea. And as these things become more commodities, and it becomes yeah. harder and harder to make a profit from that, you know your your fortunes are going to rise and fall without you know a lot of hope for stability. Low margin goods. Keep that in mind when we get to our our, our big discussion with yes. Amazon and Walmart. <laughs> Engadget reports that the Samsung Wallet will stop taking purchases on June thirtieth in anticipation of Samsung Pay, which is scheduled to arrive in September. Any reservation and tickets in Wallet will still be valid through partner apps, but coupons will no longer be available. And now for some news from you. If you'd like to head on over to our Reddit, that is reddit.com slash r slash daily tech news show. You can submit everything that you would like. And uh, listen, we use it, especially on a day like today when we're hunting for stories because the great man Tom Merritt is not here for us. We rely on the Reddit even more than ever. Star Fury Zeta wanted to make sure that we saw the U.S. House of Representatives voted 338 to 88 for the U.S. Freedom Act, which regrets the NSA bulk collection of phone records. The vote heads to the Senate with support from the White House, intelligence agency leaders, and U.S. Federal Appears, Appeals Court. However, the Senate leadership wants to extend the existing language of the Patriot Act through 2020. I, yeah, I mean, great. I just think whenever you build a machine that wants to have that kind of power or capabilities, you know, it, it's, it doesn't quite go away that way. It, it, and I'm all for that, and I hope that we're persistent in protecting our privacy, but yeah, skeptical. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, whenever you build a gigantic bulk collection agency, uh, everything looks like a relevant piece of data, no matter it, how much you try yeah, it. it and it's but, uh, the people who are like, yeah, we passed this thing because we didn't really think it through, and there are people <laughs> warning us about the unintended consequences. It would be obvious, and we ignored it. No, 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 no. We now we've got this under control. <laughs> well, all right. And SP Sheridan sent us the Verge report that the Wolfram search tool can now identify any item in an uploaded picture, according to the creator Stephen Wolfram. Quote, it won't always get it right, but most of the time, I think it does remarkably well. It, the Wolfram Language Image Identification Project was fed, quote, a few tens of millions of images to learn, including tricky ones. Uh, an image of a cat in a spacesuit, a sloth in a party hat, and <laughs> Chewbacca himself. When given an image of Tom Merritt, the image identifier uh, pronounced that he is indeed a person. I played with this yesterday, and it is really good. It was very, very good. I only had, you know, a few wild misses. Like I put a chimpanzee feeding a tiger, and it said that it was a sleeping bag, um, which <laughs> maybe it is now. I don't know. Um, it was very, very good, and it's interesting. The Wolfram Alpha platform is basically this big computational engine. We've talked about this before on Weird Things a long time ago, where Google wants to create search. Stephen Wolfram, this is the guy that created Mathematica, brilliant, this guy's a genius, is creating this computational platform so try, to try to understand information, and you can ask it questions. You can go there, you know, how far away is Mars right now, and it'll calculate that. And to put in image processing as part of the API that you can build technologies that would then have this is really cool, and it's kind of scary because now you could put, give it a photo and say, where are all the soft targets, and it could draw circles around people. You know, something you know your camera can do on your phone, but sure. it is it's interesting. It's very exciting, and you look at where the technology is going for self-driving cars, and how much being able to figure out what you're looking at is super important. And this was considered a trivial problem 40 years ago in AI, a summer problem, and they realized is much much more complex. And that does it for the headlines. Now to get into our discussion, uh, Andrew, we have. Uh, what I view to be 
two massive entities that I think are coming ever closer to getting into kind of an open firefight. Let, let's, let, let's take a look at Walmart's first, uh, just the news here. Walmart uh, is going to uh, do an invite-only uh, delivery service, very similar to Amazon Prime. It'll do three-day delivery as opposed to two, and we'll have seven million products available at launch. Uh, the uh, th this comes on the heel uh, the heels of a uh, October 2014 quote from uh, the CEO of Walmart uh, outlining growth strategies at their annual meeting for the investment community. He said, quote, there's a growing consensus that the future of retail is not just in-store and not just online. The winners in retail will be those that can put them together, and frankly, we think we're already doing the harder part. Locations matter because convenience matters. We have the stores, the associates, and the experience in the physical world that others will need to build. He went on. Specifically, we will moderate the growth of investments in stores and increase our investments in e-commerce, which seems to make the point that, you know, especially now that we know one of the projects that they are launching out on this, that this is more and more of a priority. So let me make this plain. Is this a threat to Amazon? I think anytime somebody is willing to spend billions of dollars to try to get into your territory, as Walmart's doing, as Jet.com is doing, you can't ignore it. I think the problem here, and 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 I might actually be a little bit more bullish on Jet than maybe Walmart, is that you know I I got you know as I explained before, I have this big huge stupid box with one little strip of batteries in there, and I'm an Amazon Prime subscriber, and I love it, and I don't know that Amazon made money on that. I don't know that they made money on that. I think, you know, Amazon has some fun little tricks that they can do as far as, you know, doing payables in three-month increments and stuff and make interest money on rolling over payments to vendors, etc., and create billions of dollars, etc. One of the things that when you look at Amazon's stock valuation, it's ridiculous compared to the amount of profits they have, and the, the belief is that Amazon is building towards this bigger future and is able to keep itself going, but is building to this bigger future. And yeah, they'll ship this to you right now and not make any money, but maybe five years down the road, they will. And Or they're just making sure that I'm a good customer and then I'll keep going to them to other things where they will make money. I don't know if Walmart is in the position to lose money like that. Well, so th there's my question. Because Walmart has is is about the only people who are probably more ruthless with price negotiations than a company like Amazon does, considering their scale. Does a price war between these two companies effectively hurt both of them, considering that their margins uh, for for either of them aren't necessarily great? Like, how much lower can they go? Yeah, and it's it, it's not so much trying to compete in price. You know, they're looking at and trying to compete in like delivery and. I, if you order in some areas, Amazon gets it to you that day. And I can order stuff. And I, I get packages on Sunday now, and I don't even think about it, which is just sort of a weird idea. And yeah. Amazon hires people driving their own cars to do that. And as you look at companies like Uber look, getting into delivery and stuff, I don't know that Walmart is involved enough in their – you know, they're trying to get to where Amazon was 10 years ago. Amazon's yeah. trying, Amazon's, you know, half seriously, half not, whatever, making drones and things like that. And Walmart's trying to get into a market that is already going away, and Amazon's trying to move forward. And as far as, yeah, Walmart can certainly get great prices on stuff, and, you know, you saw the way that, you know, why they were resistant towards credit card companies and Apple Pay in some ways because they hate that losing that 3% because that means a lot to them. I just think that you look at Walmart had a great opportunity early on in online when they tried their you know their their Netflix competitor and yeah. it was it was riddled with problems it wasn't profitable but it probably would have been a very good idea for them to have kept doing that because when I go to walmart.com like I don't even know if I have an account I think I may have bought some things from them but it's not I use it so infrequently that you know, I don't. Where you know, one of the things that Apple talks about, which was really smart, is with their iTunes, they would talk about how many credit cards they have on file. You know, we had 20 million, 100 million. You know, they have yeah, a gazillion credit cards on file. And what that meant for Apple was, you could go to iTunes and press one button, and we could send you something. You didn't have to go through and fill out your address, fill out all this other stuff. And it's gonna be, you know, you know, it's it's. We like Walmart because I can just run across. Well, not in LA, but you can just 
go down the street, there it is, grab it, and be done with it. The idea of Walmart, well, now we can get it to you in three days. How is this better than Amazon? You're, you're charging me 50 bucks less a year? Great. What kind of streaming movies am I getting? You know, What yeah. are all these other perks that I'm getting? I haven't heard anything about Walmart making studio deals for content. Uh, the only thought, though, is like, let's say if you are within 30 minutes of a Walmart that you can get within three hours delivery. If, if now all of a sudden they leverage some of their physical locations to make this more of a, a, a instant situation. I mean, they made a point that convenience is their key. Okay. Um, that's one of those things that sounds kind of neat on paper conception, like, hey, we have a Walmart store, we have products, you have a house. Look at what it costs to get a pizza delivered. They deliver, somebody delivers a pizza to your house, and they now charge a service charge for the pizza delivery. You know, you're paying another four or five bucks on top of that, and then you're expected to tip the person who brings this thing to you, okay? It is expensive to do local delivery. Local delivery, nobody has been able to make a big impact in local delivery outside of delivering pizzas. And for the idea that, you know, Amazon's going to have a service where they is, are they going to do that with $3 batteries? You know, are they going to do it with the small little things? It's great if everything is a $500 camera, but most things aren't. Are they going to do it for spatulas? And they're going to have to have minimums to say, oh, you know, $50 or whatever. And all of a sudden you start getting into this structure. And assuming that they can do this effectively, I don't know if you've ever been to Walmart and talked to some of the people there who work there late at night, but, you know, you're on your own. Well, uh, we would like to hear what you guys think about everything. Uh, feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, one was Alex Hanna, a.k.a. Tinvec. He wrote in, Howdy, Justin, Andrew, Jenny, Roger, and crew. Too, too numerous to mention. I've got a pick for you. It's a website that's been around for over a year, but arguably has increased in usefulness over time. Have I been pwned.com? That is uh, H-A-V-E-I-B-E-E-N-P-W-N-E-T.com, in case you're a noob. It is very, it's a very simple site that does one very helpful thing. It scans through your known data breaches for email or username that you enter. Why is this helpful? As the saying goes, knowing is half the battle. If you see that your information has been compromised on a website, you can change your password or take other similar actions to resecure your information. The site has also had some good info on large data breaches that have been in the news if you want your pants scared off. I hope this helps people to be more secure. Thank you very, very much, Tinvec. I have a question, though. <laughs> um, if I wanted to attach uh, IP addresses to names of people, you know, uh -huh. because I wanted, I was maybe, I had a legitimate, you know, tracking company that was making, you know, adware or whatever. I wanted to do pop-ups and all that, and I wanted to know the names of the people doing that. I would create a site where people would go in and enter their name on their computer, and then I would know this. And I'm sure this is legitimate, but <laughs> I would be even suspicious of something like this. Well... All right, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, always, ne never, never, don't trust anybody. Uh, but but well, check it out. That was our pick of the day. I'm just uh, I'm just saying. I, 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 again, my point here is is if this was done by, you know, somebody with some reputation at stake, I would be a little bit more trusting of that. I just think that you know, you go here and type in your email or your username, and all of a sudden they have that attached to an IP address. I'm sure it's legitimate, but but. It's like when I would get, you know, uh, you know, Bank of America used to send these sort of warnings, like legitimate warnings about, like, you know, oh, here, you know, you need, to, you know, create a new password or do this thing or whatever. And it was very easy to have done man in the middle attacks. Very easy to. Have done. They don't do that anymore. But yeah. Anyway. No, listen, that's a good point. Uh, messages. Uh, let's go ahead and read one here. This one, uh, or sorry. Yeah, I don't see where this comes from. Yesterday, Tom and Scott discussed the announcement of the new Ultra Blu-ray Blu format, which supports 4K video. Uh, Joshua Gardner wrote in about the unspecified audio format, and they mentioned, uh, just an FYI, uh, the reason the audio format is unspecified is because there is an audio war going on. Dolby is fighting for Dolby Atmos, which features the traditional seven-speaker setup plus a subwoofer, but also adds two speakers in the ceiling for additional height. 
Dolby has stated this sound format is expandable to as many speakers as you wish, although they have stated that most audio will be mastered to support a maximum of 12 speakers plus a subwoofer, discrete channels, requiring the receiver to create additional audio channels for anything over the 12 channels. DTS has yet to announce a sound format, but should very soon. One of the primary differences between DTS and Dolby Digital is DTS uses uncompressed audio, which consumes more disc, disc space, versus Dolby Digital, which sacrifices a fraction of audio quality and frequency response, both on the upper and lower end, to use about one quarter of the required space. It should be noted that most people do not have high enough end equipment to hear the difference. <laughs> Again, feedback at Daily Tech News Show if you would like to send in either feedback on stories or a pick. Andrew, thank you so much for, for helping out. We, we survived a, a Tomless episode. Thank you, sir. Uh, not that I was just here to plug my book, Name the Devil, on sale July 7th. Bookstores everywhere. Um, I was here for you, sir. Of course, of course. Uh, people can pre-order the uh, Name of the Devil right now. Just go oh, ahead. Yeah. Amazon, wherever you like to find your books, and search for Andrew Main, Name of the Devil. And if you're like, well, Name of the Devil, that sounds really cool. I wish I could read something exactly like it right now. Well, you're in luck. Angel Killer, uh, the first book in the Jessica Blackwood series, uh, for which Name of the Devil is a sequel, is also available not only in uh, print, but also ebook and audiobook formats as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, Twitter? Where, where can people find you? At Andrew Main on Twitter. At Andrew Main on Instagram. Facebook.com slash Andrew Main. YouTube.com slash Andrew Main. Or if you want to sign up for my newsletter, AndrewMain.com. M-A-Y-N-E. And, of course, a special thanks to all 5,054 patrons who support this wow. show. And thanks to all the folks who support in other ways, one-time donations, PayPal, purchasing, the TNS gear, and just being you, you special little gumdrops. Thank you so, so much for uh, continuing to uh, support the show and support it even when they let chimpanzees like me run the ship. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Call us at 512-59-DAILY and listen to the show live at TuneIn uh, at alphageekradio.com. Visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. Tom is out of the office again tomorrow, so watch out because it's Producer's Choice Friday. Jenny Josephson and Roger Chang are hosting the show. Regular Friday contributor Darren Kitchen will be on. To defend or hand to defend packets, and Len Veralta will create a courtroom sketch. See you tomorrow. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program is so good, it's like you're there. Finally. I hope you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> And there we go. Good job, gentlemen. Roger loved it so much it crashed his chrome. It did. <laughs> it did. That's not too hard. Uh, man, I'll tell you what. That was a... That was a, a lot of reading. I, <laughs> I somehow neglected to, to count the headlines because I kept just seeing it in the one view. I didn't realize we had 12. <laughs> yeah, how Sorry. many do you normally have? <laughs> like nine. <laughs> They, I kept not seeing them all in the same view until I was like, wow, we're still in headlines? And I went back and kept it. <laughs> we did a good job, Justin. You did a great job. It was a great job. There was a uh, lot of news. Jenny, let's say good. Let's give them reason to. Oh, right. Improve. Okay. Yeah, only good. <laughs> only good. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, a lot of words. That's uh, that, that Tom Merritt, man. He's got a hell of a job. Yeah. You know, the amazing thing I've learned from watching Tom Merritt and you do these kind of shows, and it's a very good skill that, that I, I, I try to want to emulate, and I think we could all, is you can get a discussion going and somebody can make a point that you disagree with, and you can let them have the word and they go, all right, next topic. Yeah. You know. Uh, that's, I mean, it, it really is uh, the, the thing that I've always loved the most about Tom's work and really has gotten me obsessed with his, his shows, including this one, uh, is... That dude plays point guard better than anybody in podcasting. Like the 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 ability to kind of not only do what is normally 
him in guest shows, but uh, when it's more panel shows, which we're going to get more and more into with Daily Tech News Show now that we have uh, all the contributors, uh, it, it, it's really, really hard to... Uh, when, when, when you are a, a pundit, you know, and you are used to just saying like, oh, take, take, thing, 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 let, let me keep the conversation going, it's almost unnatural to say, no, next. Like, let me shut down the like the take thing what tom's really good at is making the two second point the addendum point and then kind of uh, uh moving it into the the other uh the other frame of uh of reference so i've been i've been trying to do that on weird things too where you know because like my instinct is like no you're wrong and i'll prove to you why i'm right you know and it's like <laughs> all right it's going to go backward let me just let somebody say it and then go all right well let's go to this now yeah um, well cuz you know there's always time, and that, that's the, the funny thing about it is that it always makes for more time. It makes for a better, quicker show, and it makes for more time. So it's like you're always just able to even get to more and talk about more in, in more substantive ways uh, if everybody's – if the, the length of everybody's point is almost just a little shorter. You know, it just, it yeah. just makes more room for everything. Um, well, thank you guys uh, so much for hanging out um, and, and not just throwing fruit at me. Uh, and and uh, I do appreciate it. Show titles. Yes. I'm levelating, so this is a good time. I, I realize why Tom sometimes has a three-second delay in the post show is because he's actually doing a whole bunch of complicated things that are really hard. <laughs> uh, okay, show titles. Um... Uh, <laughs> the number one WTNS that that would be weird things news show. Um, for me, who watches the stolen watches? Uh, I, we have I, to I have a watchman. Yeah, that one. Uh, that one's very very good. By the way, uh, applause to everybody who is not making a show without merit the number one uh, suggested topic. Uh, that, that is <laughs> good. That shows growth. That shows <laughs> I, I'm I'm proud. That after uh, a, a decade of Tom doing these shows and eventually taking a vacation, uh, that that's not the number one. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I am a fan of um, oh, hey, Walmart Prime. Did you just Prime. get a thing from, from Tom on your Apple Watch? No, oh, I got uh -oh. it on Slack. Oh, Justin, did, did Tom send you a congratulations on your Apple Watch? Like, listen, come on. At this point, it's just picking on the kid who wears a helmet to school. <laughs> did you get one on your watch? Did you get? Did you get it? <laughs> Stop it! Apparently, um, I should be getting. I should be getting a notice any day now because they've apparently started shipping the model I ordered finally. I uh, I'm a fan of Walmart Prime. Because I it just is, it was, was your main Walmart topic. Walmart Prime is good. Uh, BioCal makes a point to say, thing. Fury. I'm not sure if Andrew's in chat. But tell him, Tinvex pick hashes your submission in the browser before sending it in. Yes, I know it can still look up the username or email, but it is a legit site vetted by Steve Gibson of security now. And also it's run I by a, trust, a guy who's very trusted in the security world, Troy Hunt, I think his name is. So, so. I believe all of these things. I also believe that, that, that I guess, like, the... the uh, when we get into my friend says they're trusted, and and you're coming from the critical thinking area. Well, how do I know? You know, it, it, that's the thing. I, and again, I believe this. I think it's legit. I think we can look it up. Totally believe that. But we get into many of these problems arise because I got an email that says it's from Facebook, and Facebook says I need to do that. Well, Facebook's trusted. I trust Facebook. Well, no, it didn't really come from Facebook. You know, that's the, that's where these problems arise from is because. We use reputation that we don't quite know, or we hear second secondhand reputation or whatever. But again, I think it's totally legit. I think it's totally legit. It's but it's just sort of to me, it's kind of you know. Well, I would I would have it hosted by a you know yeah party that represents. I, I think it's one of those things that's like it's really good to know not just to plug your username into some any old thing. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the takeaway. Well, yeah, I think in the spirit of the site, it's a good thing to think about. Like, the whole point isn't like, oh, here's the panacea for, for security, right? It's to be more knowledgeable about it. So whether or not you want to use it based on the fact that you don't feel that it's a secure portal, if that's what you believe, then that's cool. You know, then that's, I think that that's kind of what they're going for. Then you are, then you are uh, 
you know. For the record, I am confident enough that it's secure that I would put my own name in there, my own information <laughs> in there. <laughs> I'll make that very clear. But I just remember when I first saw this pop up a few weeks ago or one of these other ones, like, hey, go see. And I went to go. I'm like, oh, I'm like, well, I don't know anything about this, <laughs> you know. Um, by the way, I now am ashamed of all of you who have made uh, the show without merit the number one vote getter on show. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, asked I, for I, it. I how, about the just, how about the show with Justin? Uh, it's it's uh, I'm leaning Walmart towards Walmart Prime. 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 Walmart yeah. Prime. That's uh, it. And uh, it's going to take me a little while to edit because I actually have to add in a couple things um, post-show. So you can all talk as long as you want, but don't wait for it all to be done because it'll just gonna take a little bit. Uh, that is perfectly fine. I actually yeah. need to get to uh, a few other things, but but thank you guys so much for your, uh, watching me clawed my way through an otherwise seamless pro uh, process. Uh, if uh, yeah, I wish I could be here tomorrow, but uh, I know. You guys, you guys do uh, rock and roll, huh? Producer's choice. It'll be Producer's fun. Choice. It'll be fun. Right, okay. Adios. I'm stopping it. I'm stopping it. Bye. Bye.